Hi, this is Phil Newman from Longevity Technology, and I'm joined today by the CEO of BioViva, Liz Parrish. Hi, Liz. Hi, it's good to be here. Oh, well, it's great to have you here. And of course, you're freshly minted with the Bacon Prize. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, that was a that was a shock to me. I, I was I was really uh, quite thrilled and um, been sharing some pictures about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. And of course, um, you know, I wasn't able to come to Radfest this year, but it looked like a, uh, you know, a really great, great event. And of course, you know, the work that you've been doing in both patient advocacy and the professional work you're doing in biotech is being reflected by uh, by this reward, right? Yeah, it's really kind of my humanitarian effort to get involved in, in every way possible and make sure that you know, I'm not only helping to develop better drugs uh, for the future of treating biological aging, but that we're getting people access to those drugs and that we're creating new pre-regulatory routes to even expedite that access for um, those who need it, which are more than 41 million people this year. Yeah, well, I guess that's a very interesting point to jump into perhaps this, the work that you're doing on your studies, because I think it was 2021 that you did your uh, dementia study. I think that was like a five patient study. Um, and have you been doing any more work since then? Because I know there's, when we spoke recently, there was some work you're doing, but have you got any more results that you've been uh, collating? You know, one of the things that we're uh, going to be releasing, I think in the next 12 months is a paper on uh, what happens when uh, people take telomerase reverse transcriptase gene therapy and the data that has been collected for over five years on that. And uh, in a couple of the talks that I did this year, we released the data on 10 patients, uh, the 20th percentile shortest telomeres and, and the changes in those. Uh, but the paper should be more expansive than that because you know the, the problem uh, when people get early access to technology in variety of locations of the world is you can't do the same tests every location in the world. And you actually have to have tests that they can do locally uh, so that they can do follow-up because without the, the follow-up data with, of the exact same test, uh, we're, we're sort of out of luck. So on 10 patients, we were lucky, lucky enough to get a the shortest 20th percentile of telomeres, but you'll also see um, many more patients in their average or median length telomeres coming up. So that's that's the, the exciting uh, stuff that's coming up. But uh, vastly, all of that was done uh, several years ago. And so now what we're doing is I've been pushing hard on a pre-regulatory route in several countries, and I can't talk about those countries right now, but you're going to see some of those going online. Uh, in the next year. And that will uh, create a legal uh, route for people in need to get access to things like gene therapy. Uh, right now, we work with what's called investigator-led studies. So vastly other uh, companies and, and other uh, medical doctors have to lead investigator-led studies. And then BioViva, uh, when we're able to, we pick up the, uh, the data uh, and we pick up the uh, patenting rights when we can so that we can move those towards clinical trials and towards a bigger audience. So, so when you say, um, let's say, uh, clinician-led, so, so this may be uh, like a third party organization that mm -hmm. wants to adopt your therapies in a kind of experimental study um, for their clinical um, investigations, but likewise, you might get some spin out IP from the back of that. Yeah, ac absolutely. So they are, they are legally run uh, studies. And so they're called investigator led. And um, we're, we're really good at building networks that know how to do those. We have uh, 12 exclusive doctors who uh, work with a company, Integrative Health Systems, that we work with uh, for the data analysis. And then we will apply protocols if they can meet the protocols, which, you know, this actually is the convergence of research and clinical work, which is kind of has been historically an oil and water uh, situation, but we have gotten really good at making it run smoothly and making everyone like it. So clinicians, you know, they treat. Um, they have been historically responsible for a lot of uh, excellent data in patients who couldn't get access in other um, regulatory systems and helping uh, millions of people, actually, you know, medical tourism is, is a huge market, but uh, binding it with research and creating mandated protocols in which uh, so much data has to be, is required pre-treatment, and then so much 
uh, data is required post-treatment isn't actually their specialty. And so that's where we come in uh, to bridge that gap. Uh, because what's important is if people are traveling uh, abroad that we uh, and taking uh, a risk on, on new technologies that we create evidence-based medicine out of that use. And applying that that evidence back into, let's call it mainstream channels, right? bringing some of that back onshore into the USA, what does that look like in terms of the, the pathway? So you've got a, you know, you're doing a, a 10 patient study, you're getting good results out of that. What, what do you do next? What's that commercialization pathway for you? Yeah, well, the, the telomere data is a little bit se- uh, separate. The, the new paper will be uh, people who had actually uh, participated in telomerase reverse transcriptase gene therapy for a myriad of uses. And then it's culminating that data. It's an interesting paper because it says if they took it intranasally, if they took it by IV, by which dose did it have the biggest effect or any effect on the T lymphocyte uh, blood cells? Because, you know, that's where we're kind of uh, crushed uh, to do the same tests that have some amount of validation. And so that one will be a little bit different. But uh, for the dementia study, that was uh, five patients who had intranasal uh, gene therapy of two different um, uh, genes uh, for uh, cognitive decline. And uh, those, hopefully, those studies will continue to grow. You know, we're constantly seeking uh, nonprofits to help pay for patients to get access. And, and you know, just to be clear, an investigator-led uh, study is often actually more thorough than a clinical trial because the amount of data that we can collect by choice is actually higher uh, than is often required otherwise. And when you're looking for a mechanism of action, when you're treating biological aging, you're gonna do two things. You're gonna go after the disease markers themselves, the um, uh, approved uh, endpoints of a regular clinical trial in something like dementia, but you're also going to expand it into markers that may not be diagnostics today, but are the diagnostics of the future. And so those would be things like epigenetic age, telomere length, and um, et cetera, looking for a proteomics that may not be uh, approved at this time. Yeah. So, so when I just kind of, um, let's take, for example, a five patient uh, dementia study, there may be different different delivery mechanisms, um, but likewise, there are different studies going on that perhaps are more experimental and looking at other diseases of aging. That, that all sounds very, very early stage and obviously very interesting. And I guess that what I'm interested in, Liz, is the, is the, is the bridge between, between that early stage activity and, and, and scaling up. You know, you mentioned oh, yeah. obviously all those patients that you want to get to. So how does that work? Do you see that staying offshore in a kind of you know, longevity medical tourism world, or do you see that coming back onto, you know, an FDA approved pathway? Well, you know, our job is to get that. There, there's so much to unpack there. Unpack there. We, we could literally talk an hour about this because it's so exciting. So, you know, I have I have personal go- goals and of course, uh, personal goals of BioViva because we are a US company and we can't do clinical trials offshore unless they're FDA approved. Our goal is to get those onshore to the U.S. And um, so we have applied for our pre-IND and got our response. And so we're just sorting out now uh, how much money we have to raise to get into phase one for dementia. So we immediately brought that back. We applied to the U.S. FDA and said, let us go, because an investigator-led study is a legally run study. I I think that a lot of people have missed. Uh, perceptions of medical tourism. It, you know, uh, an investigator-led study can actually sometimes be safer uh, than a clinical trial um, in a, a regulatory body just because of the massive amount of oversight and the, you know, no one wants anything to go wrong. So, you know, really uh, lower doses are adhered to and, and, and ramping up in titration is, is very tightly monitored. Uh, but uh, I want medical tourism to be open to everyone forever. And, um, and, and that's, that's probably for uh, my BioViva investors, maybe that, maybe that makes them go, hmm, but actually they, they will still have uh, the biggest market uh, being open uh, to a regulatory system in the US and the EU. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of incentivization to get drugs to everyone. And that's where you, the companies would make the most money. But what I like about medical tourism is it forces the price down. Uh, 
you know, the the cheapest gene therapy that's approved in the United States is four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars to treat one eye. And, and they just go up from there. If your child is born with spinal muscular atrophy and would die otherwise in a few weeks. Yeah, teary eye. Hang on. Let me get myself. Under. Anyway, it's between two and five million dollars for the gene therapy. Right. And um, it, it, it's just they, they are the most expensive drugs on the planet. But if you go offshore, those are a fraction of the price. Um, you know, a, a two to three million dollar gene therapy is between two and three hundred thousand. That's still too expensive. But as more people are using those uh, routes, they, they the price will come down and down because really gene yeah. therapy is expensive, less expensive by scale. If you're making gene therapy for one person, you're looking at two hundred and some thousand dollars to build a therapy. But if you're making it for 10 people, you know, now it's maybe eighty thousand dollars per per dose and, and, and down and down. So, and no, I didn't work that. I, I don't have that in front of me, so that's not exact, but that's thereabouts. Yeah. But I guess it's kind of interesting that you're, you are looking at the, the FDA routes and mm-hmm. PIND. So, so it may be that you're, you know, in clinic within a period of time now. Yeah. We which hope is, to be within a year. Time, within a year. Right. And that, and that's for dementia. So I guess that that first pass is going to be, uh, safety, right? Um, but obviously, then there's the efficacy piece, which you, you've got some experience of now with uh, with patients. Yeah. Um, question for you, Liz, which is something that I think resonates from a perhaps a presentation that I saw you give, which is the age of recruited uh, patients into into studies. So presumably, when you're um, uh, doing your studies offshore, you can get to a slightly older population where you might be able to demonstrate. Uh, albeit, you know, perhaps on a on a different quantum, you know, more efficacy than you would do in a perhaps a traditional study. Would that be a reasonable assumption? Well, the the great thing about offshore studies is you can kind of go for the the whole Monty, right? You can go for um, safety, you can uh, collect efficacy, and you can collect titration data, you know, in a way that sort of gives the company know how in which other companies entering clinical trials just don't have. So, I mean, your company can go and spend 10 to $50 million or more. I've, I've met companies that have spent, spent hundreds of millions of dollars on animal studies. And um, you have literally um, no knowledge of how a drug is going to work in a human. And so, you know, the investigator-led study gives us the ability to go into clinical trials with that. And so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. This is why I'm pushing for the pre-regulatory route. This is why I'm pushing for, a, it's a platform called Best Choice Medicine that would allow people right here in the United States to get that pre-regulatory access with the same ease as medical tourism uh, without having to go abroad. Got it. Okay, so so that's really what I guess that what I was trying to understand is the fact that people would be able to get out, get access to it in a trial environment because let, let's face it, you know, if you're running out of runway and you want to try and be as um, as optimal as you can be, whether it's through your, you know, your your own personal uh, neurodegenerative decline or your or your relatives or your or your partners, presumably, then if you're in a position where you can get that access, you'll be able to get access to it quicker from a clinical perspective as well as from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, and and also the these uh, pre-regulatory routes and the offshore studies speaking to what you were mentioning about the dallies and qualies of people who are qualify for a clinical trial, you can go way um, outside of the bounds of those. So, you know, it's estimated that more and more people will live to be over the age of 110. But today, in uh, all clinical trials, almost every single one of them, I haven't seen one that hasn't, the cutoff is 80 years old. And if you have comorbidities, uh, you do not qualify. So in gene therapy, there are some comorbidities that would would disqualify a person like an active cancer um, and things like that. You know, you have to take care of the cancer before you could qualify for a gene therapy just to not completely convolute the data. But you can have comorbidities offshore and you can be over 80 offshore. So it really meets a need that's not met uh, in the U.S. Plus, you know, the uh, narrowness of our clinical uh, studies in the U.S. disqualifies a lot of people. So, you know, offshore, you might be able to look at all dementia patients and then, um, you know, uh, move them into specific cohorts of, of 
endpoint data, whereas, you know, onshore, you're limited to a, a specific type of dementia. So, you know, it's just we, we really need to open these pre-regulatory routes to the UK, to the US, to countries in uh, Europe uh, so that more people are getting access and we're de-risking uh, the regulatory systems that are at risk at first to look at these certain drugs to begin with. Yeah, understood. Uh, let's let's talk about your uh, your capital raise because obviously you're fundraising at the moment. Is that something that you've kicked off recently, or are you kind of doing a rolling close just to keep things funded as you go along? You know, we're What's actually uh, this year we're we're going on dry powder because the the investment uh, arena looked so poor. Uh, we had so many people tell us that this was not a good year to raise. Uh, so we decided to uh, burn on dry powder and look at what it would take to get into a phase one study. And then we will open up based on that. And I believe it's later this week that we have uh, one of our uh, meetings for the IND. And that is just parsing through all of the information that we got back for the pre-IND for dementia and then seeing what uh, the requirements are um, in order to get into humans. And, and so I think we, we got pretty lucky on this one and it's going to move pretty quick. But I think that we have a little bit of money that we have to spend um, on the front end here just to get into the study. And we're assessing that. We have a, a CRO that's going to be on the call and see what it takes to streamline that. So we will open up to funding again after uh, we make sure that we have met all these requirements and we have all of the money um, uh, earmarked for exactly what we need uh, to get into phase one. And then of course we'll be raising for the phase one. And then we've got a, a second drug uh, that we want to put into pre-IND um, and that will also be part of that because we want to start uh, running drugs in a succession. The second drug will be a candidate with our CMV delivery. And so that will be a first in use for CMV as a gene therapy delivery in humans. Um, and that's going to be really exciting. Oh, well, great. Well, uh, Liz, thanks so much for joining us today and uh, best of luck with the IND and then the, the follow on round when you're ready on that. Sounds very exciting. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll tell you all about it as soon as we have a number. <laughs> Let us know. Thanks, Liz. You're welcome.